Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Yavin Ehrlich. Terrific. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here and tell you about our work. So my talk is going to focus on genetic privacy. And the interest that I have in genetic privacy goes to the days that I was an undergraduate researcher. And at that time, I worked in a computer security company as a vulnerability researcher. And we used to be invited by banks and credit card services to do penetration tests and check the robustness of their systems. And what I'm going to show you here is one of my favorite hacks. And so this is the door to the IT department of a major bank in Israel. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> and the door is controlled by a fingerprint reader, but also by an intercom, which is a very simple device. You press on the button, it calls the secretary, and if he or she knows you, they would press eight and open the door. <laughs> what I'm going to show you is that each one of you can open this door with your own cell phone by dialing the tone eight from your machine. So currently it's 10 p.m., no secretary in the building. Let's see how, how it works. So we are calling the secretary. No one is there. Dialing eight and taking the money. Don't try this at home. <laughs> OK, so after we do something like that, we can go to the security, um, chief security officer of the bank and have a constructive discussion about the limitations in the system and think about different solutions. And this talk is structured around this type of hack, right? I'm going to show you some limitations to genetic privacy. And hopefully during the Q&A, we can have some discussion and think about some creative solutions that we can move forward. But the thing is to remember that genetic privacy is far more complicated than protecting your bank account. And let me highlight a few challenges that we have with genetic privacy. The first challenge is that we must share genetic information in order to seize the genetic revolution. What you see over here, this young, uh, beautiful um, girl over here, she suffers from hemifacial microsomia. This is a strong asymmetry in her face. You see that she, uh, her earlobe here is absent, and she also developed medulloblastoma. Her mother approached my group and asked us whether we can help to find, to identify the genetic mutation that causes all this syndrome. And by sequencing her genome and comparing her genome to the genomes of thousands of healthy individuals that volunteered from an altruistic, altruistic perspective to provide their genetic information and share it with the scientific community, we're able to pinpoint the pathological gene and really offer some alternatives for this young girl. And there are thousands of stories like that in the scientific community. So without people like you that share your genetic information with the rest of the scientific community, we cannot move forward genetic medicine and help the, <clears throat> sorry, and help the people that we love. And another thing, not related to genetic medicine, is that sometimes we want to share our genetic data for the purpose of genetic genealogy. I'm the chief, sciencer, the chief science officer of MyHeritage. We are one of the largest consumer genomics company with nearly three million tests. How many of you have taken a consumer genomic test? Raise your hand. Okay, terrific, wow, so many people here. And, and you know that when you take a test like that, one of the purposes of the test is that you can find some far relatives. And most of us do that because we just want to learn more about our family and just have more, um, kind of like when we do our genealogical inquiry, we want to find more branches in our family tree. But for some people, namely adoptees, and people that were conceived by sperm donation, the ability to find a biological family is paramount. Let me tell you a short story about this person over here. His name is Dotan, and he lives in Israel, but he was adopted about 30 years ago from Brazil. A few years ago, he went back to Brazil and tried to locate his biological mom, and yet the only thing that he had was some uh, the paper records. He went to the hospital that where he was supposed to, to bo be born, and they told him, you know, there was not a single baby that was born at your date of birth. 
It's a very small hospital in the rural part of Brazil. And when you walk with these adoptees, you realize that this creates an emotional toll on them, that they just don't know what happened in the first months of their life. Where did they come from? So I convinced Otan to take a MyHeritage test. And about a week later, he texted me and told me, I found my half-sister. She lives in New Zealand. She's also an adoptee from Brazil. She's actually older than me. And this is for the first time that he found someone that looks like him. And this story has a deep personal connection to me because Dotan is my first cousin. And by doing that, and, and this is where my family really realized the power of DNA, you know, kind of like what we do at my heritage. By doing that, I really help a person that is really close to me and was able to locate his uh, half-sister. He still didn't find his mother, but maybe when the database will become larger, we can get to that point as well. So sharing genetic information is important. And so if we want to share information, there is some tension between privacy and sharing data. This is the first challenge. The second challenge is that it's quite hard to protect the privacy of genetic information. Let me tell you a short story. Here we have Jim Watson, the person, part of the duo, that discovered the structure of DNA. Now, Jim was also one of the first people on Earth to get his entire genome sequenced. And he thought, I want to share my genome with the community, with everyone in the world. But you know what? I really don't want to people that people will know about my Alzheimer's risk. And there is a gene in the genome called APOE that if you have a specific configuration of mutations, it increases substantially your risk to develop Alzheimer's. So the team that worked on his genome said, you know what, Jim? No problem. What we're going to do is just to redact this part from your genome and we release everything except that part so people will not know what is your Alzheimer risk. But the thing is that some smart people from Australia realized that they can go and impute back this missing piece. So how this algorithm works without going into the math, let me give you kind of like an intuition. Can you read this sentence? Okay. And, and, and the thing is, you can read, but, but let's think about it for a moment, because this sentence has so many possibilities over here, or each letter has 26 possibilities, now start to multiply that, you have a huge search space. Yet your brain, when I ask you, you immediately nodded. How did you do that? Because you know that there is covariance between closed letters in English. You know, if there is a Q, you would follow after that. Certain combinations are just, they don't make sense. So since you have kind of like the dictionary of, or some part of the English, the English dictionary in your brain, you can quickly search many words and get to the right combination. The same thing is in genomes. In genomes, variations are co-inherited together. So if we have a dictionary of many genomes that we saw before, we can use an algorithm called genetic imputation, and if this piece is not too large, we can impute it back. And know what's the status of APOE for Jim Watson? So the take home message from this slide is that even if you are Jim Watson, a really smart person, you discover the structure of DNA, you still struggle with understanding genetic privacy. It's not so easy. The third challenge that we have with genetic privacy is that when you share your genetic information, you create some externality with other people that are correlated with your genetic information. What do I mean by that? If I share my genome, 50% of my genome exists in my son and also in my mother. And also, if I had siblings, also with my siblings. So by doing that, when I take the decision, my personal decision to share gen my genetic information, in a way, I already give something for my close family members. So some people say, you know, you should consult your close family before you share genetic information. Other people say, hey, this is not something that we usually do in liberal societies, because in liberal societies, we assume that you have autonomy on your body despite externalities on your close family members. Let me give you a story to emphasize that. This is a blogger from Tunisia, and she wanted to protest female rights in her country. So she take uh, half-naked photos of herself and post it on social media. In her country, in her society, doing something like that creates externality to her close family. But since we, uh, we, we um, 
adhere to liberal values, we know that she has the rights on her body. Nobody can tell her what to do with her body despite the sectionalities. So if we agree to that, why do we think that you don't have the right on your DNA to share it and you need to consult your family members? Okay, so after kind of like discussing these um, challenges we have in genetic privacy, I want to now go to the more technical part of my talk and tell you about two gaps that we have currently in genetic privacy, two types of methods that we can recover the identity of people from their anonymous genetic information. And I have uh, two parts in my talk that I'm going to tell you. The first part, I'm going to show you how we're going to infer the surnames of anonymous males. So for this part, all the females in the audience, you're good. <laughs> for the second part, I'm going to show you how we can use relative matching to infer the identity of individuals, both males and females. So let's start with the first part of the talk about uh, inferring surnames. So we know for over a decade that there is a correlation between the surnames of individuals and the Y chromosome. How does it work? Let's say that we have here the Smith family, and this family is having a son. The son will get the surname, the Y chromosome from his father, and also the surname in most Western societies. Now, if this son is getting married, and will also have a son, he will give his son his Y chromosome and also his surname. And this process creates a correlation between the Y chromosome and the surname for over several generations. Now, genetic gene genealogy companies are aware of this correlation and they offer services where they will send you a swab to sample the DNA in your cheek. You put it in an envelope with um, about $99, depending on the service, and then they will genotype a series of short tandem repeats or STRs, which are just nucleotides like that, they just repeat multiple times, and they're going to measure how many times this nucleotide, this motif, is repeating and report that in some database along with your surname. So what we have basically over here are my own test results. See early over here. And the reason that people do this type of process is because it's a lot of fun. You learn, you get to know your patrilineal relatives, maybe find a black sheep in your family, and kind of like know about the history of your patrilineal uh, uh, line. So that's a lot of fun. And when we thought about this, Kind of like we realized these databases in around it was 2011, we thought, you know what? Can we use the same strategy to infer the surnames of individuals that we don't know? And we decided to focus on two databases, smgf.org and ysearch.org. Now, don't search those databases because just a few months ago, both of them they disappeared from the internet. This one was disappeared due to GDPR concerns, and this one about two years ago. Uh, but there are other places now that you can find uh, Y chromosome uh, information. But in this talk, I'm just going to focus on these two databases. At that time, these two databases had together 140,000 surname and Y chromosome information records together. And if you see here, this is the number of records in the database in log scale compared to the prevalence of the surname in the US population. And you see that there is a strong correlation between the number of records and in the, in the database to the prevalence of the surname in the US population. You have the most prevalent record is Smith, and then we have Johnson, Brown, Williams, and, and so on. Okay, so how are we going to find the surname, to infer the surname of someone in the database? Let me give you some intuition without going to the mathematical details. The process starts as follows. We're going to take the Y chromosome of the person of interest and scan each record in the database. What we're going to do for each record, we're going to compute the time that these two individuals, these two males, had a common father. All the males in this room, all of us, we have some patrilineal lines that are all coalesce. We all come from a specific male at some point. So we're just going to use the genetic data to estimate when this shared father lived. If this person lived thousands of years ago, we say, hmm, probably they don't share the same surname. But sometimes we are lucky, and we found that this father actually lived not that long time ago. And that, then we know that maybe these two individuals share the same surnames. 
together, and then we can infer that the surname of our target, the person that we don't know, is the surname of this individual in the database. Let's try that now empirically for the US population. So we took a person, the y, uh, uh, short number repeats on the Y chromosome of a real person in the US. We queried these two databases, ran our algorithm, and then inferred a surname. Since we know what was the surname of this person, we compared to see whether we got the right one or not. To generate some statistics, we run this process for over 900 individuals. And what we found is that for US Caucasian males, we have about 12% chance to recover the surname correctly. Now we say 12% oh, is so low, but think about it. We now have a project by the NIH called All of Us that is going to collect 1 million genomes. If I can infer the surname of 12% of them, that's hundreds of thousands of people that I can infer their surname. Now, the surnames that we infer in this process are not very common. It's not the Smith that we infer. It's kind of like the surnames that are rare, but not ultra rare surnames. On average, when we know the surname, so if we have in the US in the order of something like 150 or 60 million males, if we know the surname, we can reduce the search space to something like 40,000 individuals. Now you say, okay, but that's 40,000, Yaniv, come on. How can you get me, can you give me a single person? And the answer is yes. How can we do that? Because most, in most genomic databases, you don't just have the genome, you also have the age and the state. Age and state are two identifiers that are not protected by HIPAA. When you go to the pharmacy, you go to Rite Aid or, or CVS, and you purchase a drug, they are allowed to report, here is a person in California, age, 63 that purchased this drug. This is not private information. They cannot put your name, but they're allowed to put these demographic identifiers. Same thing with genomic databases. We have the genome, we have the state, we have the age in some cases, and now let's say that we can infer the surname from the Y chromosome data. How many individuals a profile like that would match? We use the US census to estimate that. So we sampled from ages, let's say someone age of 40, lives in Colorado, surname Adams, how many people would match this, this profile? We repeated this process 100,000 times very quickly on the computer, and what we found that if you have the age, surname, and state, your median, in most cases, you will get a list of 12 males or less. When you have 12 people, at that point, you can just call each one of them and see whether they participate. Maybe not me, someone with a nice accent can do that, but no. Okay, so you got the point. Okay, so now you ask, Geneve, that's very interesting, but you kind of like show us this like mathematical kung fu that it's possible. Does it really work in a real case? So let's see that. We took the genome of Craig Venter, one of the um, founders of, of um, uh, modern genomics. He lives not far away here in San Diego. And his genome is publicly available from a website on the NIH. We downloaded his genome, and we used a tool that we uh, developed in the lab called Lobster to profile this short tandem repeats on his Y chromosome. By the way, it's a kosher, kosher lobster, by the way. <laughs> then we took this, the results that we have from, the, from Craig Venter. We went to ysearch.org, and for each marker on his Y chromosome, we just inserted the numbers. And this is the actual picture from Ysearch. Then you click on the search button, wait for a few minutes, and you find that Venter is your top match. So I just showed you that we can take the genome of someone and recover his surname. But now you ask, okay, Niamh, but there are probably thousands of Venters out there. Can you get to Craig Venter? And the answer is yes. Let's say that we, we recover the surname Venter. He lives in California. He was born in 1946, and we know that he's a male. If you take this combination, you go to ussearch.com, which is a public uh, uh, engine to search records in the US. It's amazing what you can do on the internet, right? All these like things. <laughs> and you just plug these four things, you get two matches, one of which is our friend, J. Craig Venter. In fact, you can even pay $5 and get a phone number and email, but we didn't have budget for that. We used the free version, it was too expensive. Okay. So I just showed you that we can go from a genome to an identity of someone. But now you might ask Yaniv, but that's very, very interesting.
but you knew that Craig Venter is Craig Venter when you started the process. Can you employ this process on people that you don't know who they are? And the answer is yes. We decided to focus on the Thousand Genomes Project, one of the flagship projects by the NIH. Thousands of genomes that are essentially, allegedly, de-identified. We took some genomes from the CU population. These are Utah individuals, and they're representative of the US population. So we downloaded their genome, 10 genomes. We, again, used Lobster to recover the short random repeats on the Y chromosome. We queried the two databases, and we predicted the surnames. In eight out of the 10 cases, the ancestors of these people lived in Utah, which was quite interesting. This is what we expected. Then we focus on one case over here. We infer the surname of the paternal grandfather and of the maternal grandfather. Now, I don't give you the exact pedigree because we want to respect the privacy of this family since the data is still out there and you can repeat the process. And what we did, so I'll give you some the, kind of like the details, but not the exact details. We went to Google and we did something similar to that. We searched on Google and boom, the top match in Google, that come from the top results, was an obituary of a family that exactly matched the description of this family. What do I mean by that? The surname of the father in this obituary was exactly the same as the paternal grandfather. The maiden, the maiden name of the mother was exactly the same as the surname of the, grandma, of the grandfather from the maternal side. The number of kids was exactly the same. The birth order of males and, and daughters and, and sons was exactly the same. Think about it, like flipping a coin multiple times and predicting these flips. The ages of the people was exactly the same. And of course, this family was from Utah. So we thought, what are the chances that we got to the wrong family? And the chances are less than five times 10 to the minus nine, okay? So then we were very excited. We submitted the paper for publication. And the reviewers, you know, in scientific reviewers, they always come from like, like this like frowny face, right? It's a beginner's luck. That's like beginner's luck. So we said, okay, now we have to do it again, right? So we, again, more genomes from the thousand genomes. We, we cover this family and also this family over here. In fact, we had so much data at that point, Facebook accounts of some of these people, obituaries and so on, we can actually look what is the connection between the people in the thousand genomes, this NIH, database, and the people that participated in the genetic genealogy Y chromosome analysis, and you see these are not the same people, that's the important thing. Here we have the second cousin, once removed, participated in some Y chromosome analysis, and by that identifying his relatives in this medical database. Here we have the first cousin, once removed. Here it's, how they call it, it's complicated, right? So. So you don't need the same person to be in your genetic genealogy database to find the people in the medical databases. This information travels through these deep genealogical lines and allows you to identify many more individuals. This is quite unique to DNA information. So in total, after we, we, we covered the identity of all these individuals in black, this was close to 50 individuals in this medical database that we got their full identity. We published this paper in Science a few years ago. Before we published the paper, we, don't want, we, we knew that this will create a lot of noise. So we first contacted the NIH and we told them, we have this story. The same way that we do with the bank, right? First you go and you discuss it with the security manager. Let's talk with the NIH, see what they can do to maybe mitigate the problem, maybe warn the families, just to be like a good person for courtesy, let them know. So they actually wrote, they said, okay, wait with your story. We want to write some sort of an analysis or, or a perspective. So they published back to back with us a perspective about the complexities of genomic ident um, identifiability. And the paper, we were quite pleased to see the public response for this paper. It was covered by so many journals. And, and, and this is important. And this is why also I am excited to be here because we need to communicate this type of gaps in genetic privacy with the general public. You are the stakeholders of, of, of genomics. You are going to benefit from genomic medicine. We expect you to, if you wish, to consider donating your data to genomic medicine. So we need to engage the public in these important discussions. Okay, so that's the first story. So, so far, women, you were safe, right? Okay, now we have a different story. 
Okay, so I told you already that one of the most important features in genetic genealogy is the ability to find relatives. So here we have, let's say, these two third cousins, this pair of third cousins, and in most cases, they co-inherit chunks of DNA from their um, ancestors. And this co-inheritance of chunks creates what we call identity by descent, or IBD regions between them. So if you look at the chromosome here of this person, it has the exact same sequence of DNA as the chromosome here. And by searching our database for these exact matches between two individuals, we know that they are related and connect them. And this process is quite powerful. Here you see the probability to find various types of cousins. And even for third cousins, I don't, I don't know my third cousins, by the way, I know how many of you know, but quite far relatives, we have over 80% chance to find those individuals by scanning our database. And this led to many success stories, right? I told you about my cousin, Lotan, but at my heritage, we have many more success stories from talking, these are two half sisters that found each other, and we have Holocaust survivors that, that found each other after so many years, and just regular genealogists that are excited to find a new branch in their family tree. Now, here is one limitation that we have for this analysis. We can only find your relatives if they took a DNA test with the same company. So if you were tested with 23andMe and you were tested with Ancestry.com, you will not find each other because you're in two different databases. So the way that the community mitigated this problem is that we have several places, including MyHeritage, NFT DNA, GEDmatch, and DNA Land, where you can upload your DNA, which is just a text file. You can upload your DNA, you can bring it from the lab that you were tested, let's say 23andMe, upload it to one of the services, and this way you can find more relatives without going through the process of purchasing another test, waiting for the results, and so on. It's a way to accelerate the discovery of relatives. Now, the police realized about a year and a half ago that they can also use this type of service. <laughs> and they can also take maybe the DNA from a crime scene and upload the DNA to GEDmatch, which was at that time the only website that allowed the police to do something like that. Maybe the best example is capturing the Golden State Killer. So he is one of the most notorious criminals in the history of the US. The FBI has been searching for this person for over 40 years with no avail. They went to some police databases, but it didn't show up in any of them. Now, the police is using a technology that is not as sophisticated as the genetic genealogy technology. They can only find either you, if you are in the database, or maybe your first degree relatives, in some cases your second degree relatives, but this is far more complicated. And they did this process, and no one showed up. So about a year and a half ago, they consulted a genetic genealogist, and she suggested that they will upload the data to GEDmatch. They will just render the data to look like a direct-to-consumer data, upload it to GEDmatch. They did that. They found a third cousin match. And then through a process, very complicated process, they were able to map the family tree and eventually found a profile that exactly matched the description of the Golden State Killer. Someone that lives in North California, has some police background and so on. They went, obtained a DNA, I think it was from the knob of his door or knob of his car or something like that, obtained a DNA and found a perfect match to the crime scene sample that they had. They arrested him and brought him to justice after all these years. And I have to say that this process since then has been used in multiple cases. In fact, two weeks before the case of, three weeks before the case of the Golden State Killer, DNA Dope Project used that to identify the buckskin girl, a missing person, for over uh, 30 years. And we have here a Colleen that runs this, the DNA Dope Project. So I want to actually give her like a round of applause for founding this and, and many other types of uh, um, missing people. The DNA Dope Project only focuses on missing individuals. They have unidentified bodies for decades and they use this strategy to identify this type of people. Now you see this is quite complicated, right? On one hand, we have all these like really horrendous criminals that we can now capture. On the other hand, we use these genetic databases and in a way kind of like there is some tension with genetic privacy. So we decided to actually study this process from kind of like more technical perspective to know what are the chances 
that we have to find someone in the US population using these databases. So for that, first we focus on the MyHeritage database. At that time, last summer, we had 1.2, 1.28 million individuals in our database. And then for each individual, we looked on, for this individual, how many relatives this person has above the, a certain genealogical relationship. What do I mean by that? What is the chance that we have a match with total identity by descent sharing above a certain threshold. Identity by descent, the, the numbers goes to up to 3,600. If you have a 3,600 centimorgan, this is centimorgan match, it means that you found your twin brother, your monozygotic twin, or yourself. And then kind of like as you go to zero, it means that you have very far relative. So over here, you see kind of like the, um, relation, the genealogical relationships and how they span different types of identity by descent um, intervals. For instance, Second cousins usually appear between 100 centimorgan to 400 centimorgan. Third cousins between zero centimorgans to about 150 centimorgans, and so on. So what we found is that using the MyHeritage database, for 60% of the individuals of, in the US with European origin, we have at least a third cousin match in our database, similar to the Golden State Killer. To corroborate these results, and see that they are robust, we repeated the same process with GEDmatch. We, do, of course, don't have the data of GEDmatch, but GEDmatch has a very liberal policy that each one of you can go to the website and just look at the profile of any random person. So we used the random number generator, we just took 30 random profiles, and we did the same, the same process, and we found very similar results in terms of that we also we have about 60% chance to have about a 60% chance to find a third cousin relative. Okay, but now you might ask, these databases are getting bigger and bigger. What's the general probability as they go to and collect more information? So for that, we developed a mathematical model. And our model first considers, let's take, let's say we have a pair of individuals that are related G generations ago in a population of a certain size. Then what's the probability that these pair of individuals share identity by descent segments that we can discover in our database? And then let's repeat this process with a database of a certain size that covers X percent of the population. So let's say we have a database that covers that we collected 1% of the US population, 2%, 3% of the US population. What are the chances that we have at least a third cousin match? Now, I want to highlight that we have some, this, our analysis, our mathematical model is quite simplistic. It doesn't take into account that sometimes we have consanguinity. Cousins are getting married. Of course, not in our families, in other families. <laughs> and we have also population structure. People in New York tend to marry kind of like people in New York and Connecticut and this area, and less people, let's say, in California. So, but with these kind of like caveats and this, this uh, um, simplistic model, we had these results. As, so this is a probability to have a match as a function of the size of the database, as percentage of the population. And for first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, and fourth cousins. Now, we estimated that using the data, the size of GEDmatch in 2018, this is a, the probability to have a third cousin match using this model. And we thought, okay, this probably will take now a few years until we get, you know, like to a larger size and kind of like higher probability. But just a few weeks ago, we discovered, and this was by report by the New York Times, that, oops, Family Tree DNA also decided to work with the FBI and open their database. I have to emphasize the point, we at MyHeritage, and also 23andMe and Ancestry, which are my competitors, we do not work with the FBI or law enforcement agencies. This is not our policy. FTDNA, from their own reasons, decided that they want to open their database for the FBI. And by that, now, Law enforcement agencies have access to about 2% of the US population with European heritage. And that means that virtually for every person in this ethnic group, you will have a third cousin match. So you can think about it that this is the first time in the history of any country that we have genetic surveillance of large parts of the population. Now, you might ask me, okay, and if that's very interesting, but you just showed us that you can get a third cousin match, K 
can you get from the third cousin match to the person of interest? And the answer is yes. When you have a third cousin match, you effectively reduce your search space from 325 million Americans. Let's say you, you try to find a Golden State Killer. Everyone is a suspect, including people here in this room. Okay? We have 30, 325 million people. We have a third cousin match. This will reduce the search space to about 850 individuals. Now, we, used, we published a paper about a, a year ago that looked at the kind of like very large family trees in the US, unrelated to genetic privacy, just how uh, family trees look like. So when you look at family trees and you ask, okay, what is the probability? How many, first, how many third cousins do you have and where do they live around you? You find that most third cousins actually live not far away from you. If you live now here in, in California, most of your third cousins, on average, will live somewhere also around uh, where you live. Now, in, there is a study uh, of serial uh, criminals that found that most serial criminals operate within 25 miles. The crime scenes are within 25 miles of where they live. But in this analysis, we said, you know what, let's say that you can reduce the, the geographical search space only to 100 miles, to be conservative. If you do that and you exclude all third cousins uh, um, beyond 100 miles, you reduce the search space to about 370 individuals, just by this piece of information. But now you can also say, you know what, the Golden State Killer, we know that we're not looking for someone that is five years old, and probably not someone that is 90 years old. We know that he was probably should be in his like 60s, maybe 70s. Let's say that we can kind of like say that we are looking for someone, and, but we know the, the decade of the age of this person. By knowing the decade of the age, we can reduce the search space from 370 uh, uh, third cousins to 33 cousins. And of course, we know that we are looking for a male and not a female. And therefore, we can half the search space to 16.5 people on average. So that means that theoretically, if you have the genealogical records and you invest the time to do that, you can get very close to the person of interest. And at that point, you can employ regular investigative techniques and point on the right individual. Okay, now we tend to think about this process of using genetic genealogy to find criminals, but the very same technique can risk the privacy of research participants. Remember the Thousand Genomes Project that I showed you how we can recover the surname of the Utah families? Now we took one of the Utah families, and at this time, instead of focusing on the husband, which we recovered his, his surname in the past, and therefore we knew what is the identity of his wife, we just looked at the wife's genome and uploaded her genome to GEDmatch. This process revealed two matches, one in North Dakota and one in Wyoming. These two matches were quite far relatives, in the order of like a third, maybe second cousin once removed, relative of this person. And they were also far relatives of each other in the order of fourth cousins. The first thing we did was to, kind of, to go and find the ancestral couple that connect these two individuals. And this was extremely fast. One hour of work on the internet, you can build a family tree that connects these two individuals and we go to the ancestral couple over here. Therefore, we hypothesized that the person of interest is a descendant of these individuals. And this was actually, the, most of the work was basically a full day of me and my collaborator looking at different genealogical records, tracing this family tree, all the different branches, until we found a profile that exactly matched the description of this family with the same number of kids, the age of the person was the same, she was from Utah, the order of the kids was the same, and so on. So therefore, we could identify her and again, this, the name that we found in this process was the same name that we found through the Y chromosome of her, of her husband, validating the two approaches together. So the point what I just showed you, this process can also risk research participants. Ironically, the new common rule that was just enacted basically two years ago said that biospecimens can be de-identified and used for secondary research without additional consent. Sure, yeah, almost comical. And we suggest that we should amend the common rule. This rule, by, by the way, dictates all uh, uh, the bioethics of all federal 
re sponsored research in the US. So we should think we should amend the common rule because biospecimens cannot be de-identified. We know that, that showed that we can identify them if they have a Y chromosome using one strategy, we can identify them from these autosomal matches and there are other techniques that are out there. So we should amend the common rule. Another thing that we suggest is this technical measure that will allow us to mitigate the risk, both for research participants and for regular genealogists. What we think is that kind of like you have two types of searches in these databases. One are legitimate searches, people that were part of, just took a direct-to-consumer test and upload their data to GEDmatch. They want to find relatives. Good. But also we have some maybe illegit illegitimate searches, maybe searches that produced by research labs. You don't want them, by medical centers and so on. So what we suggest is that direct-to-consumer companies will sign the data sets using a cryptographic signature to authenticate them. Now, it all sounds fancy in science fiction. It's super simple. Let me explain you how it looks like. Here is a file, let's say, for my heritage. I just want to add another line to the file with some random characters. Now, these random characters will be determined based on the private key of the lab that developed the file and your genetic information together. Now, the lab that process your file will put their public key online. And now GEDmatch can fetch this public key and check that the file was in fact produced by this lab and was not tempered. If this is the case, they will allow to search the database. If not, they can say, hold on, that's a different onboarding process. Maybe it's Colleen and her DNA Doe project and we actually want to allow her to do that. But let's verify that this is Colleen and maybe not the Russian government trying to upload the DNA of US individuals. Okay, so this gives a tool for the direct-to-consumer databases to differentiate and develop a policy, to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate searches and develop a policy who is allowed to search in the database. So we published these results in another science paper uh, just a few months ago. And I want to tell you, can of summarize of my talk. I see dirty smiles here. <laughs> that I'm working in genetic privacy for now seven years, and it's a complex issue. And I think that even that I work in genetic privacy for such a long time, I still don't fully understand privacy. And the story of Ashley Madison is, emphasizes how kind of like it's unpredictable. How many of you have heard about Ashley Madison? Raise your hand. Okay. So Ashley Madison was a website, is still a website uh, for cheaters. Um, now, the point is that this website, all the information around 2016 was leaked. 36 million profiles. Talk about email addresses, sexual preferences, being a cheater, credit card numbers, the passwords were not well protected. So this is a full nightmare. In fact, there were 200,000 email addresses just from Israel. We have 2 million households in Israel. 10% of the country is like... <laughs> <laughs> One of the parliament members also was, was found there. Now, I thought, you know what, this is, this is a disaster. He, take my genome, I don't care about my genome, but Ashley, this is like, this is, the skies are going to fall. And you know what, not, I was not the only person that thought that. There was a New York Times article talking about Ashley Madison recession, because divorces are going now to go off the roof, you know, spike. Many people are going to get divorced. And, and they even suggested that we should uh, um, that we're going to see an increase in the price of small apartments because of the high divorce rates. <laughs> now, I thought I, I should invest. I understand this thing. I will make some money out of it, right? Amazing. But here is the thing. You know, fast forward. Most people don't remember Ashley Madison. In fact, it's even surprising. If you look now at Ashley Madison on the website, it ranked in terms of traffic 5,000 in the, in the U.S., it's a quite, still quite popular website, despite the leak. As a control, I look at the National Academy of Sciences, which is hosting me today, <laughs> and people are more interested in Ashley Madison than what is going on in this room right now, okay? <laughs> despite Ashley Madison not protecting the data of users, and despite their abuse of users, and despite telling people that they deleted their profiles and they never deleted their profiles. And this is to show that we don't, the psychology of privacy is tricky. It's not straightforward. 
I want another example. How many of you heard about uh, Facebook and the modeling of the elections? Raise your hand. Everyone should heard about that, right? Okay. The surprising thing is that in 2012, Facebook published a paper in Nature saying that they can mobilize, they can actually mobilize people, political mobiliza mobilization of people by Facebook messages. They can do that. They were proud of it in 2012. <laughs> what happened? This is the thing, privacy is tricky. Things that in 2012 we were excited about, 2019 we're not excited anymore. So it's not easy to get these things right. And this is the same thing about genetic privacy. So what we should do in the future, how we should approach that, I think, instead of thinking about privacy, which is a zero sum game, either I give you my genome but you cannot protect it and so on, we should focus on developing trust relationships between individuals and data custodians. How do you develop trust? You have transparency. You have a reputation system where you have independent people rating the privacy and, and, and the reputation of different services. And you also allow individuals to delete their profile. If they are unhappy, you should allow them to delete their profile and walk away. And this creates kind of like not one-time game, but it's like multi-round game that data custodians will not benefit from violating the trust of their individuals. Okay, these are the people that, the main people that contribute to the study. We have many more, but kind of like the main characters. I want to also thank the MyHeritage research team, which is amazing, and the MyHeritage research participants that allow us to do the second study. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.